Welcome in, everybody, to the Audio Ground School podcast by Part-Time Pilot. I am Nick Smith, founder and creator of Part-Time Pilot. So thanks for, for joining me today. So in today's lesson, we're going to continue the Audio Ground School podcast. So we're going through, through the Part-Time Pilot Online Ground School. And we're in Section 3, Pilot Certifications, Qualifications, and Regulations. And we're going to be on Lesson 7. So if you're following along inside the Online Ground School, you can read through the lesson, then listen to it. Maybe watch the video that's associated with most of these lessons. And then you can also take the quiz to reinforce all that knowledge. When you do that, this is one of the things I highly recommend, especially for some of this content, like the rules and regulations. that. Don't exactly paint a clear picture in your mind. They don't have that great visualization as you really just have to use repetition. And that's one of the reasons I started this podcast so that you can you can consume it in multiple forms and consume it multiple times and kind of save time. So you can you can read the lesson at night and then the next morning on your drive to work, you can listen to the lesson and that way it'll be reinforced better in your mind. So anyways, we're going to be on lesson seven, which is FAA advisory circulars. And then we'll probably get into lesson eight, other airmen certificates and ratings, and then maybe even lesson nine formation flight. There is a lesson 10 on dropping objects, but I already covered that in the last episode of the podcast, episode 12. So we will not be covering that again. And let me just check something. I want to make sure that... I am talking about, yeah, so last episode was episode 12, so we're on episode 13, lucky number 13. Uh, Let me know if, uh, I don't know, is anyone out there, are you guys uh, superstitious about 13? I I was always curious if pilots maybe avoid altitudes with like 13,000 feet or something. I know that's kind of a weird altitude to fly in because it would be right above where you need like supplemental oxygen and stuff like that. So I don't know if a lot of people are flying at that altitude anyways, but I wonder if there's pilots out there that are superstitious about that, but I'm not superstitious and I like, I like the number 13. So episode number 13 of the audio ground school podcast. Now, before we get started real quick, I just want to mention that we've got, if you are listening to the, the audio ground school and you're thinking about maybe joining the online ground school and you want to know what other people think, students just like you, we actually use this website called trustpilot.com. It's just a coincidence that it it says pilot. They actually do reviews for all sorts of industries, but I thought it fit for Trustpilot. It's a very transparent and safe and secure review website. In fact, like when I first started, I just tried to leave myself a review and they wouldn't even let me do that. So it it's it's very it's very helpful in that. And if you go to trustpilot.com and just type in part-time pilot, we now have 55 reviews. You know, I, I wish that more people would leave us a review, especially those that go on and pass the FA written test. You know, we've had over 300 and like 20 or so students go on and take and pass the FA written test. But I just started this not too long ago and I don't I don't advertise it too much. But I just want to read a last couple of reviews from from people, from our students, just so you can get an idea of what other students are saying about part-time pilots. So this is Candace Peets. I gave a five-star review and says, love this ground school. I absolutely love how user-friendly part-time pilot is. There are so many resources offered and the support from the community is so amazing. It's a great experience and the videos are very helpful. Thank you for saying that. Next one is Jason, five-star review. I am very new to pilot training. I am very new to pilot training. Part-time pilot is set up for success. Very user-friendly. The lessons and explanations are easy to digest. The additional material that is available for download is extremely helpful while completing the program. Here, this one is from Kristen, another five-star review. I am embarking on a career change at 35. I am embarking on a career change at 35, and I love how Part-Time Pilot gives the information in an easy-to-understand manner. They offer live videos, podcasts, one-on-one review, not to mention how much is saved by doing a ground school online. The last one I'll review is by Josh, Joshua. Five-star review. Again, part-time pilot is nothing short of remarkable. Thanks, Josh. Part-time pilot is amazing. 
I was looking at so many different online ground skills, but once I learned about part-time pilot, it instantly shortened my list and made my decision really easily. I am 16 looking to pursue a career with the airlines and aviation. Thank you so much for this course. You guys are a blessing. So those are some of our reviews. Now let's continue. Let's get into the lessons. Thank you for letting me do that. Just for those out there that might be thinking about it, go to trustpilot.com, type in part-time pilot. You can read those reviews for yourself. Okay, so let's get started with FAA advisory circulars. If you have ever had trouble interpreting a FAR or a fuzzy or on how to apply it, an FAA advisory circular is designed to help you. An advisory circular, or AC, refers to a type of publication issued by the FAA to provide guidance for complying with certain airworthiness regulations, pilot certification, operational standards, training standards, or other FAA rules. They define acceptable means, but not the only means of accomplishing or showing compliance with airworthiness regulations. Advisory circulars are a, use a unique numbering system to help pilots quickly identify the general topic of the circular. All circulars start with the letters AC followed by two numbers, a dash, then three numbers such as AC number number dash number 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 so there's five total numbers uh two numbers and then a dash and then three more numbers the first two numbers gives information on the topic and the last three numbers is the specific identifier identifier for the advisory circular in that topic so that just will allow you you can see a number you kind of get an idea of what it's about when they release them and if you're following along in the in the the ground school you can see a list below with uh, numbers and corresponding categories for the circulars so the categories again are the are the first numbers and you have double zeros which are subject matter related to general just general aviation or general general piloting things one the tens one zeros subject matter related to procedural rules the 20s through the 40s, so that would be 20, 21, 22, all the way to 38, 39, 40, and then 41, 42, so all the way through 40s. Subject matter related to aircraft, so specific to aircraft. Uh, the 60s are subject matter related to airmen. 70s, subject matter related to airspace. 90s, subject matter related to air traffic and general operating rules. Then you have 119 is subject matter related to certification of air carriers and com commercial operators. The 120s through 130s, subject matter related to air carriers, air travel clubs, and operations for compensation or higher. Certification and operations. 140s are subject matter related to schools and other certificated agencies. 150s through 160s, subject matter related to airport noise compatibility planning 170s subject matter related to navigational facilities 180s subject matter related to administrative regulations 190 subject matter related to withholding security information and 210 subject matter related to flight information so i've talked about in previous episodes where some of these lessons and throughout the ground school there's a lot of information and not Every single piece of information you need to to remember word by word. Some of these lessons, there's there's a lot of content because it aids in your understanding of a concept like how airplanes fly, for example. Some like these lessons where we're talking about advisory circulars or the our previous episode when we were talking about rules and regulations and incidents and accidents. And I said you know, when you, I talked about what, what's needed when you have to report to the NTSB, what, what you have to put in your report that obviously you don't need to remember that as a student pilot. It's good to know the certain things like when you need to submit a report and what type of accidents that causes. So, but then when, if an accident were to actually happen, actually happen, then you would be like, okay, I know I need to submit a report. Then you'd go look it up and find, and the FAA knows that. So the FAA is not going to ask you about like everything you need in a report. S similar thing for FAA advisory circulars. 
they're not going to ask you to re- or expect you to remember every single one, but they do have some questions that I've seen on the FA written. And you may also be asked by an examiner, probably not, but you might on things that are related to you as a student pilot who's going for a private pilot license. So what are those areas? Well, that's the subjects in the 60s, right? Those are subject matter related to airmen. The subjects in the 20s through 40s, that was member subject matter related to aircraft. 70s, subject matter related to airspace. And 90s, subject matter related to air traffic and general operating rules. So those ones are going to cover the things that you have to know and learn as a student pilot getting a private pilot license. Specifically, obviously, there's the 10s and zeros, which are uh, procedural rules and general might want to remember those too, but I specifically have only seen questions on asking what advisory circular numbering group is for subject matter related to airmen. And so you would say 60s. Or what is it for airspace, 70s? What is it for air traffic and general operating rules, 90s? So those are the only three questions I've ever seen. I would say that on a private pilot test, they are definitely not going to ask you about subject matter related to administrative regulations or subject matter related to withholding security information, the 180s and 190s, for example. So just remember those important ones, you know, the the zeros, tens, twenties, forties, sixties, seventies, nineties. Maybe, maybe those five or six, try and remember those, what those are, and then move on. Okay. And that's actually what we are going to do is we are going to move on and we're going to move on to the next lesson, which is other certificates and ratings. A couple episodes ago, I think maybe that was episode 10. We talked about categories, classes, and types of aircraft. And then we talked about how if, for example, if you're going for single engine land, private pilot certificate, if you if you got that, for example, and then you wanted to do helicopter, you would that is a whole different class. So that would be a whole different certificate. But if you're within that certificate, private pilot, single engine land, and you want to get a different rating, say for higher horsepower engines that don't go outside of that class then you do not have to get a new certificate. You just get what's called like a rating or an endorsement. So here in this lesson, we're going to talk about what exactly those are. There's not a a lot of questions about this on your FA written, but this is one of the most asked questions from my students because you want to know what you can do with your private pilot license and whether you need to get a whole new certificate or not. So it's it's something we all want to know. So what happens if you get your private pilot's license and now you want to fly a high performance aircraft or fly a glider plane or tow a glider plane or fly a float plane? That's one of my dreams is to own a float plane on a lake or fly a dual engine plane. Well, they all require a private pilot to take additional steps in order to achieve the additional ratings or certificate. I am going to cover all the requirements to get. I'm not going to cover all the requirements to get every single add on rating or certificate here because many of them require their own set of lessons and courses. However, I will provide an overview of some of the most common, and you can browse the practical test standards for the FAA for any additional rating you're interested in. If you're in the online ground school, just click where I say click here to see all those additional practical test standards to tell you everything you need to do in order to get those certificates or ratings. And I'll put that link in the show notes for those that are not in the online ground school. So, Let's talk about airman class ratings to add a rating under the same category and class. So this is what we call a class rating airplane, single engine land. For example, if you go back to episode 10, where we talked about categories, classes and types of aircraft and categories and classes of airman certificates, we're talking about an airman class. So that is airplane, single engine land while holding a pilot certificate, you do not have to take any additional knowledge test. So to add a airman class rating, so that's again, under the same category and class, you do not have to take any additional knowledge test. There are no minimum flight time requirements and there is no additional check rides. You simply need to perform adequate training with an instructor and have that instructor endorse your logbook. For example, here are some of 
the most common added ratings for private pilots. Tailwheel endorsement. A tailwheel endorsement does not require a minimum number of flight hours to obtain it. Tailwheel endorsement does not even require an additional check ride. Your instructor just needs to determine that you are proficient in the tailwheel aircraft and then they endorse your logbook. The FAA does, however, mandate that your instructor grade you on normal and crosswind takeoffs and landings as well as go-around procedures specifically for tailwheel aircraft. Because again, the dynamics of that tailwheel aircraft upon landing and takeoff and taxi and slowdown as you come to a complete stop are a little bit different. But this can usually be accomplished in a few hours of training. You still have to hold a private pilot certificate and be proficient and current under that certificate. The next one is a complex airplane. A complex airplane is considered an airplane that has retractable landing gear, flaps, and a controllable pitch propeller. Or for a seaplane, that would be just flaps and a controllable pitch propeller. But we're talking about single engine land, so we'll talk about the retractable landing gear as well. There are no minimum number of flight hours required. You do not have to take an additional check ride. You're required to receive ground and flight training from an instructor and be endorsed for being proficient in a complex airplane by your instructor. However, the training can be in an, a complex airplane or a flight simulator that represents a complex airplane. So that's nice. High performance airplane. A high performance airplane is currently defined as an airplane with an engine with more than 200 horsepower. Pilots must receive and log ground and flight training from an authorized instructor in a high performance airplane and be deemed proficient by that instructor. Once deemed proficient by your instructor, they will endorse your logbook. So again, it's the sort of all the same sort of things. There's a couple nuances like complex and high performance. You got to have, you know, ground and flight training. Same thing with a tailwheel and then you get endorsed. High altitude. To receive an endorsement for high altitude flight, a pilot must receive ground and flight training and specifically ground training and an endorsement from that authorized instructor. The ground training must include the following high altitude aerodynamics, high altitude meteorology, respiration, effects, symptoms, and causes of hypoxia and other high altitude sicknesses, which we'll talk a little bit about that stuff in, in our, in this audio ground school, but you'll dive a little bit deeper into it. If you want to get this high altitude rating effects of prolonged usage of supplemental oxygen, Causes and effects of gas expansion and gas bubble formation. Preventive measures for eliminating gas expansion, gas bubble formation, and high altitude sickness. Physical phenomena and incidence of decompression. Any other physiological aspects of high altitude flight. A pilot must also receive, so that's ground training. Pilot must also receive flight training from, from the instructor and, and get endorsed on that. The flight training must be completed in a pressurized aircraft, an aircraft that has a service ceiling or maximum operating altitude, whichever is lower, above 25,000 feet MSL, and must include the following. Normal cruise flight operations while operating above 25,000 feet MSL, proper emergency procedures for simulated rapid decompression without actually depressurizing the aircraft, and emergency descent procedures. All righty. So now, if we want to get something outside of single engine land airplanes like let's say we want to do single engine c we want a seaplane rating what do we have to do for that that's outside of the class for our airman certificate a seaplane rating is categorized again as single engine c class under the airplane category it is under a different class than single engine land so it's a little bit different you don't have to take any additional knowledge tests there's no minimum flight time requirements so that's all the same your instructor determines when you're proficient before endorsing you. However, your instructor has to endorse you for a check ride. You must receive a logbook endorsement stating you are competent in the aeronautical knowledge areas, which same as private pilot, and an endorsement stating you are proficient in the areas of operation for your pilot certificate and additional rating, the seaplane rating. So again, same as private pilot. Then you must pass a check ride for the pilot certificate of the aircraft rating you seek single engine C in this case, for example. So the only additional thing is that now you have to pass a check ride when you're outside of that class. Another thing is airman multi-engine ratings. If you want to make pilot being a pilot a career, then this is a critical and required step that you take to get to multi-engine ratings. This requires its own set of minimum experience requirements and flight hours. So it's 
It's almost like getting a new pilot's license. It has its own set of proficiency standards and own, own set of examinations. Again, to see what's required, you can click on the link in the show notes or in the online ground school. So Airman multi-engine rating is almost like getting a, a new a new license. Similar to like if you were to get your IFR rating. You would you would do ground, have to pass a ground test, you would do flight hours, have to fi- pass a flight test, all that stuff. Glider plane towing. In order to be able to tow a glider plane, a private pilot must have done the following. Have logged a minimum of 100 hours as PIC, that's pilot in command, in the same category, class, and type of aircraft to be used for towing. Have a logbook endorsement from an authorized instructor that certifies you have received ground and flight training in gliders or unpowered ultralight vehicles and are proficient in those areas. Then you have to have a logbook endorsement from a pilot that already meets the requirements and who has accompanied the pilot on three flights, which has certified them to have accomplished at least three flights in an aircraft while towing a glider or unpowered ultralight vehicle or while simulating towing flight procedures. So you have to have a logbook endorsement from an authorized instructor that certifies you've received ground and flight training in gliders. And then you have to have a logbook endorsement from a pilot that already meets the requirements of, of glider towing and who has accompanied you on three flights in the preceding 12 months. So then this is an addition to those endorsements in the preceding 12 months, you have to have performed three actual or simulated tows accompanied by a qualified pilot or have been towed for three flights in a glider or unpowered ultralight vehicle. So for glider towing, it's uh, it's a lot of stuff. So it's, it, there's some additional things they want to make sure you're safe. So there's additional endorsements and additional currency requirements for those. Type ratings. A type rating for a specific aircraft type is required to act as a PIC or pilot in command of any aircraft that exceeds 12,500 pounds maximum takeoff weight. All turbojet powered aircraft require a type rating as well, regardless of weight. So type ratings are, we talked about, you have the airplane category. So for air, aircraft cert- certificates, you have to have, right? So aircraft certification you have category class and type and then for airmen you have category and class so throughout this whole lesson we've talked about you know if you're within the same class or airman certificate you have to get an additional rating like an endorsement for things like high altitude high performance complex or tailwheel and then if you go outside of that class you have to get an additional rating and take take that check card like a seaplane rating or like multi-engine ratings, you have to you have to do additional tests and check rides. And then for on the aircraft side, if the aircraft is above 12,500, a pilot to be able to PIC, if it's above 12,500 max takeoff weight, you have to get, or it's all turbojet powered aircraft, you have to get a type rating for that specific aircraft. So sort of additional, you have to have your pilot's license. And then for every engine aircraft, you fly that's either turbojet powered or above 12,500 feet, you also have to get a type rating for that aircraft. So I want to sort of review because that, that's a lot of stuff. So what if you're like, OK, I just want my private pilot's license. Like, I don't care about this stuff. What do I need to know for the test? Well, most of that you don't have to know for the FAA written test. And most of it you don't have to know for your check ride. Ever, there are a few things that you might be asked on the FAA written. One of them is I've seen a question on the complex airplane. So a complex airplane is considered an airplane that has retractable landing gear, flaps, and a controllable pitch propeller. So remember that fact. I've seen a question on high performance airplane. So a high performance airplane is currently defined as an airplane with an engine with more than 200 horsepower. And you must receive a log and log ground and flight training with an authorized instructor and high performance airplane that's deemed proficient by that instructor. And then they endorse your logbook. So remember those two things for high performance aircraft. And then for, let's see here, what else? Uh, For the glider plane towing, I've seen questions on glider plane towing because it is something that, that people like to do. So the FAA wants to make sure that they throw in a couple questions here and there. Actually, more likely if you get anything on ground, a glider plane towing, you'll just get one question on your written. 
But the two things you need to remember for that is have logged a minimum of 100 hours as PIC in the same category, class, and type of aircraft to be used for towing. So again, that same category, class, and type, 100 hours as PIC. And then in the pre- preceding three, 12 months, perform three actual or simulated tows accompanied by a qualified pilot. So you remember those things for glider towing. Uh, and then we talked about remembering that stuff for high performance air, aircraft, it's 200 horsepower or more. And you have to receive your ground and flight training and get endorsed by an instructor. And then for complex airplane, it's those are airplanes with retractable landing gear flap, retractable flaps and a controllable pitch propeller. Okay. So that has been that lesson. I think we can, we can finish that up right there. That's lesson eight on other cert airmen certificates and ratings. And that's lesson eight of section three. Now we'll go on. We have a little bit more time. So let's get on to lesson nine. That's our last lesson of section three on formation flight. Surely there are rules the FAA has to prohibit pilots from performing formation type flying, such as seen by the blue angels and military aircraft at air shows, right? I mean, it seems like that's something that wouldn't be allowed for private pilots. The answer is, well, yes, there are rules. Uh, It's 14 CFR part 91.111, but this does not actually prohibit formation flying. 91.111, yes, three ones, says no person may operate an aircraft so close to another aircraft as to create a collision hazard. No person may operate an aircraft in formation flight except by arrangement with the pilot in command of each aircraft in the formation and no person may operate an aircraft carrying passengers for hire in formation flight. So formation flight is defined as a planned arrangement of two or more aircraft flying as a single aircraft in regards to navigation and position reporting. Each formation flight has a flight leader who is responsible for the formation movements. It is the flight leader and other pilot in command's responsibility, other PIC's responsibility, to maintain separation between aircraft during formation flight and when setting up for formation flight. Formation flight can only be conducted after prior arrangement and when a thorough pre-flight brief has been conducted by the flight leader with all participating pilots in command. There's a few things here that I want to restate because this lesson wouldn't be in here if it wasn't asked on your FAA written exam. So I'm going to repeat those things that are important to remember. First of all, what 91.111 says, no person may operate an aircraft so close to another aircraft as to create a collision hazard. No person may operate an aircraft in formation flight except by arrangement with the pilot in command of each aircraft in formation. So you all have to meet and have arrangement and have a plan. No person may operate an aircraft flying, carrying passengers for hire in formation flight. So even if you plan with the other pilots, you have this scheduled out plan and You've done everything else for formation flight, got a good plan. You can't carry passengers for for hire, no matter whether you're you're a commercial pilot or not. And then finally, formation flight can only be conducted after prior arrangement. We kind of talked about that, prior arrangement. But I want to add on that. So formation flight can only be conducted after prior arrangement. And when a thorough pre-flight brief has been conducted by the flight leader with all participating pilots in command. So. This is just like flight testing in in any company or the military or whatever. They have pre-flight briefs where they go over what they're going to do. And that is critically important when you're in formation flight because each, each pilot, each PIC needs to sit down and know exactly what they're going to do, needs to know the communication and call, call outs, what each word means, you know, when they're going to turn the, the entire plan because it's all about precise timing and planning when it comes to formation flying. And that's why it's so impressive at air shows. And that's why I'll, I will never do it, <laughs> but I will sure for sure watch it because that's fun to watch. All right. So that's on formation flying. Just a couple things to remember there. And that is it. That is Lesson nine of section three, if you're following along in the online ground school, you'll see that there is a lesson 10 dropping objects. I've already covered it here in the podcast. So kind of got a little bit ahead of myself on that one, but we've already covered it in the podcast. So we are done with section three. We can move on in the next episode. So episode 14, we'll call it quits for today. 
little bit shorter episodes, but it's a good place to stop. Section four is on aircraft airworthiness requirements. And then we'll start with lesson one, which is required documentation. So we've talked about what documents and qualifications you need for your airman certificate to make you air airworthy and legal to fly as the pilot in command. Now we're going to talk about what makes your aircraft legal to fly. And that's all about aircraft airworthiness requirements. So we'll talk about required documentation, required inspections, required equipment, inoperable equipment, and what to do when that happens, and then airworthiness directives or ADs. All right. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you guys have a great day. I hope you guys are learning a lot. As always, I this is in the show notes, but if you ever want to contact us, it's team at parttimepilot.com. And then we have, we're on Instagram at part period time period pilot. Same thing on TikTok at part period time period pilot on TikTok now. And then on YouTube at youtube.com slash part time pilot. So check us out there. Literally, if you contact me on any of those, I will get back to you. I'm really good at that. So thanks for listening. I'll see you guys next week and hope you have a good day.